let's bring up a map of, of global shipping lanes and, and explain what's happening. The Suez Canal is a principal route. It's a shortcut. Attacks are impacting the ability of carriers to go through that shortcut. What is the net result that you're seeing? Yeah, and you're seeing an effect, especially in the container shipping lines, where there's effectively no container shipping lines transiting through the Red Sea right now. So you see a lot of dots that are going through there, but these are other kinds of shipping lines. But the ocean containers, this is what carries most of the goods that you buy, finished goods traveling in containers, have, have decided it's just not safe um, for crew member safety. One of them got hit with a missile, two got near, narrowly missed, and these companies said it's not worth it, um, both the insurance premiums but also just crew member safety. And so they're going around. The impact is, the easiest way to think about it is, well, it's a 25% longer journey. Right. Um, and now, of course, that's delayed, but it's, it's less about the delays than it is that's a reduction in supply of ships, because you now need more ships to service the trade lane. Is it 25% more ships? In our Bloomberg reporting, Flexport has shared data on some of those diversions, right? Around 180 vessels finding an alternative route. Just explain why Flexport tracks that data. Oh, well, we're one of the largest freight forwarders in the world, and so we're, and we're technology platform, based. Platform, essentially. Yeah, it's a, t it's a platform for shipping cargo around the world. And so we, one of the things that makes people choose Flexport is we do a good job of monitoring where the cargo is. Um, and we use satellites for that. We also use integrations with the carriers. One interesting point about technology here is, like, a lot of the um, ships that are transiting the Red Sea or that are near that area have turned off their satellite transponder. Um, mm. So, because they don't want to be targeted by the, the rebels, can use the same data. So at the exact moment, you'd like to see where's the ship, <laughs> what's going on. It disappears from your system. So, um, But, you know, a 25% reduction in supply can lead to a huge swing in price. We're seeing prices between three to four times higher for shipping from Asia to Europe on ocean freight. And that's a big impact on the price of consumer goods. We talk about inflation. Or maybe people think it's under control, but all of a sudden you have these new factors that weren't accounted for. And we've seen the price of oil tick up a bit, Ryan. What about the impact on your own business? Because many would say during the supply chain headaches, if that puts it lightly, of what occurred during 2020, 2021, well, that was a boom time for Flexport. How does it ultimately impact you? Um, well, at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to serve our customers and do a good job. So when prices go way up, they have to pay more. Uh, and, th th you know, of course, that, that is what it is. It's price. It's out of your control. But it creates a lot of chaos. And, in, you know, because imagine that ship that got hit with a missile, for example, the MSC ship, the Palladium 3, it got hit just off the coast of Yemen with a missile. Well, it was meant to go to Barcelona and pick up four containers for a Flexport customer and bring them to Morocco next week. Uh, that's happening en masse on every ship that got diverted, have to replan every schedule. So teams are kind of working overtime right now trying to keep up with this and do a good job for our customers. That's what, that's what they pay us to do is make sure their cargo arrives on time or if not, that they're well informed about what's going on. And a lot of that customer relationship is something that you were really focused on when you came back to the helm of Flexport, something you thought had perhaps been sacrificed during your transition. Ultimately, how are your employees engaged at this moment? How are they feeling? They've had well, a relatively turbulent time, to put it lightly, of 2023. Uh, yeah, well, it's been a tough time for the last you know, decade of, uh, in global shipping. There's always ups and downs and, and chaos. Uh, this, we, we get pretty energized when there's something like this where you see, hey, the entire reason that we're here is to help people move cargo around the world and identify where it is, when it's going to arrive, get them accurate data. So we had you know, a team of engineers worked all weekend to um, completely update our product so that you can get, we turn every container ship orange on our map now. So if it's going around, the, if it's diverted or delayed because of the Suez crisis, it turns orange. Uh, that was, you know, kind of Herculean effort by our technology teams working all weekend. And uh, that's, that's, that's what energizes us and makes us really proud to, to be in this business. Um, so Ryan, you're back at Flexport as CEO. When last you were on the show, you joined us as a newly uh, new member of Founders Fund's uh, team. Uh, Dave Clark then left Flexport and you went back to being CEO of Flexport. Explain how you manage your time between the two and, and what you're doing mostly. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still on the team at Founders Fund as well as a, part, as a venture partner there. I've uh, been mostly focused on Flexport. Flexport's a major holding for Founders Fund and I think they understand where I'm at right now. It's like got to get, gotta get uh, Flexport going the right direction. We're, we're well ahead of our goals, so we feel good about that. Um, Founders Fund is a place where we're very patient, looking for the perfect deals. We're, we're not 
out here the most active investor in the, investor in the world. Uh, we want we want to be contrarian. We want to find things that other people aren't finding. So it's you know it's a moment for Founders Fund in general to say, hey, let's take assessment. We've been not really aggressive writing tons of checks. We're looking for the fat pitch of like the perfect company that comes along. And we do get to see most of the companies out there that are uh, you know everybody wants to get Founders Fund. I, as, as an entrepreneur, I can say that of having. Um, Tried to get every uh, the best investor has always been Founders Fund. I know Dave. Dave took to social media when that that changed happened. But just as a point of clarification, when you when you did join Founders Fund, at that time, were you expecting that you'd have to go back to Flexport, or that's something you reacted to? Uh, no, I think uh, wasn't. It was sort of a board decision that happened a couple months after I'd been at Founders Fund, okay. um, and realized hey, the, the Flexport needs to get more customer centric, needs to really focus on. Uh, gr- well, to grow in, in freight forwarding, it's a B2B business, business to business. It means you have to spend a lot of time with your customers. And uh, I think that was something that we weren't seeing enough of. And that's why I came back to Flexport to go really reignite that culture of Flexport of customer obsession. And you sort of said that actually you're outperforming where you thought you'd be, Ryan. I'm interested in, well, as we're about to all perhaps break up for the holidays, you've also got an insight into that because... Flexport bought Shopify's logistics part of the business. And then how much have you been able to focus on that, this new area of growth? Or how much has it ultimately been a bit of a distraction to what now is the focus of, of B2B logistics? Oh, well, that's, that's also B2B. You know, it's serving, serving businesses is our, our customers for that. I've been, um, it has a really great leadership team, and we sort of run it as a business unit that's, uh, I wouldn't call it autonomous, but it, it runs on its own as a, with an a amazing woman heading that name, Parisa. And she, so she runs that, but uh, I work with her almost every day on, on strategies and how do we get cross-sell that into our core customer base for the freight forwarding business and vice versa. So, no, it's not a distraction at all. It's really part of the end-to-end strategy of taking goods all the way from a customer's factory now into consumer stores and to retail stores and, and do that on an end-to-end basis. And with things like the Suez, you see how powerful that is because, you know, if you're, if you're just sitting there running a fulfillment center, there's no inventory. You don't know when it's going to arrive. Mm. You're not connected all the way back and able to reroute things and plan things and make sure the cargo gets where it needs to be. And boy, is everyone looking at when their deliveries are coming when it comes to the holidays at the current moment. To that end, is the consumer strong from your perspective? Seems to be. Uh, in the U.S., you know, we see demand is back above 2019 levels. Um, of course, volumes went way up for shipping, shipping volumes during the pandemic when people weren't able to go and buy goods and services. But what's very interesting is that while um, service consumption has gone way up, you know, things like travel and uh, whatever it might be, restaurants and massages, <laughs> those things have gone back up. Um, but goods consumption hasn't come down. It's still above 2019 levels, uh, pretty healthy consumption. And a lot of people predicted, oh, goods is going to come down as these services go, go up. But actually, services have gone up and, and goods have stayed strong. So, yeah, the consumer seems to be pretty healthy in the United States.